Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of From the Helm with Marine Max. I am your host, Lisa, and on the far side over there, that's your other host, Kelly. Right here. And we are coming to you with all the voting industry news right to your couch, right to your home. Uh, subscribe and follow us on Facebook at Marine Max Leisure, on Instagram and YouTube at Marine Max Online, and on Twitter at Marine Max to stay up to date on what's happening in the boating industry. Uh, we are very, very excited today. On uh, today's boating broadcast, we have Mr. Nick Burnham, better known as Aquaholic on the social media channels. Uh, Nick, welcome. We're so happy to have you today. Welcome. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, so why don't we start off with just introduce yourself to the people and uh, just a little bit of background about who you are. Okay, well, I'm Nick. Uh, I'm based in the UK. Uh, and my thing, um, well, I've been involved in the, in the marine industry for a long time. But the thing that I seem to be most noted for now is my YouTube channel, which is Aquaholic, which is basically mostly yacht tours. There's a few other bits and pieces on there as well, but it's mostly walking around boats and showing people into every aspect of them. And could you kind of uh, how could you give us a little bit of history uh, an overview of of how you got into this? You know what what was it that kind of spurred your your interest to do videos about yachts? Well, it's a very long story, as these things always tend to be. <laughs> we got <laughs> time. Okay, yeah. I, I started. Uh, well, I've been interested in boats for as long as I can remember. I've always been mad on boats, even as a child. I used to have. I still have, in fact. On the shelf behind me, oh crikey, there goes me, uh, there goes my thing. I still have my original brochures from when I was a small boy, and I used oh to collect brochures. These are princess brochures from the 1970s. Wow. Oh my gosh! So that's that's how deep the enthusiasm goes. That that's sure. the very first boat that that was ever called a princess. Um, wow! So uh, I'm going to pick up. <laughs> so. So yeah, so so the the love of boats goes a, a long, long way back, and uh, when I when I left school, I thought I'd get into sales. My other interest is cars, mm -hmm. and um, I thought maybe getting into car sales and maybe getting involved with cars would be good. Um, but I saw a job advertised as a trainee yacht broker when I was twenty, and I applied for that and got it, and I became a yacht broker, and I actually ended up running a yacht brokerage for about, well, I was, I was a yacht broker in total for about 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, wow. And that took me through to uh, 2009 and the recession, of course, was, was hitting hard. Then the company that I worked for had changed hands and uh, they were looking to uh, make a lot of cuts, as everybody was at the time. And, and one of the cuts was me and the office that I ran. So uh, that then uh, got me looking to do something else. I got into... Um, uh, marine journalism so I was doing writing about boats and then I learned to do photography and then the magazine that I was uh, writing for and taking photographs for said can you do us some video next time we do a boat test you do some video and I'd never done this before so I said, okay well, we'll give it a go so started doing a bit of video um, and that's pretty much how I got into it and then and then a few years later on I had some bits and pieces of video I'd done that had never been used, and I thought, oh, I'll just play, get a YouTube channel and stick them on there. Uh, and Alcoholic was born. Wow. And how, did you, okay. how did you come up with the name Alcoholic, too? Is it, did it, did it like one day it just uh, a light bulb went off or what? Yeah, I, I don't know. It just seemed appropriate. <laughs> Very appropriate. And it sticks yeah. in your head, too. Like you, you remember it. It's something that you yeah. remember, which is hard to do for the internet in general, right? Yeah, and and the thing was that when I when I started Aquaholic, which I think was 2016, I had no intention of it ever being anything kind of commercial or or anything else. It was just somewhere where I could put some some videos on the internet, more for myself than anything else. And I quite yeah. liked doing them. And I thought, well, a bit of fun to do a few more. Um, and YouTube, I was pretty new to YouTube generally uh, and and starting to watch it a little bit and of course you know it's become such a massive massive thing now mm -hmm. um, and uh, started seeing some stuff that other people was doing I thought well that looks like fun I could do that and and that's that's kind of how it how it took off so I am I'm very interested in the equipment that you use when you first started did they just like say hey just go go and start doing video or did they set you up with the camera crew how did that start well when I very first started doing writing for um, for the boat magazine. It's a magazine called Mudder It's Monthly. And in fact, funnily enough, only because I was looking something up, that is that is uh, Mudder It's Monthly. It's a magazine that doesn't exist anymore, um, which is another long story. But uh, 
uh, and I now write mostly, I still do writing and photography and video for magazines, and now it's mostly motorboat and yachting, which is uh, this fellow here, which is which is a, quite a prestigious mm -hmm. magazine in the UK, so it's a, a pleasure to be involved with those guys. Um, so anyway, when I started with Motorboats Monthly, um, I was just doing the writing, and they would send a photographer along mm -hmm. to do the photography, and then he started doing the video when we started doing video. Um, but I was freelance. I never worked. I was never employed by a magazine. I was just doing freelance, and right. I realized fairly quickly that if I could get up to speed with photography, I would be quite unusual in that I would be one of the few people who was able to just go and do the whole thing. They could just go, right. go out and do the photography, do, do the, the writing, do the whole lot. And of course, it simplified the whole process and it reduced the costs. And that worked very well. I, I learned how to do photography, bought some, some gear. And, and, and that was very popular. So when I started doing the videos for the magazine, it was with a photographer who was also doing the video. So I then had to learn how to do video, learn how to edit. And then I got to a point where I'd literally I'd go and do a boat test and I'd literally sort of plonk my camera in the hands of the guy that I was with, who from the, from the manufacturer or from the dealer or whatever, and say, can you just point that at me? <laughs> and I'd sort of waffle at it. And, and then I'd edit the video together. And that's, that's kind of how I started doing videos. Um, so that was how it began. These days, uh, it's all about. I love that you have your props. Yeah, <laughs> it's all deliberate. This is just stuff that's lying around in the office. You can see <laughs> the sure. rest of the place is. But now it's it's all about this. It's about GoPro. Um, oh, okay. I, I bought one of these just to use for a bit of messing about in the water and stuff. Mm -hmm. And there's such amazing bits of kit. That's that's it. That's what I use. A GoPro. Wow. And it's they're astonishing, really. Um, stick on a little handle. There's the handle. Um, pointed at myself and won the round. So, <laughs> Well, and it goes yeah. to show that a lot of this, it doesn't come down to, you know, how much expensive gear you have, as long as you have the, the knowledge of the product and, right. the, and the enthusiasm about the product, right? I think in some ways, the fact that Aquaholic is not super slick, super professional, super over-processed and over-edited, for a lot of people, that's part of the charm, because there are so many people doing that and doing it well. I mean, if you look at some of the videos that boat manufacturers are coming up with and boat brokers are I mean some of the films that brokers are coming up with for boats they're like little movies they're fantastic right. they really are genuinely I mean that very sincerely they're, they're amazing productions but I think against that and they, those guys are all trying to do it as best as they possibly can and quite rightly so um, and that's as much for their client the guy selling the boat as it is for the guy buying it because the guy who's selling the boat wants to feel he's having a professional job done of course <laughs> But I think that maybe there's something quite refreshing about me wandering around with my GoPro on a stick going, wow, look at this, this is fantastic, you know, and for it's sure. completely different. And the other thing is that because of my own enthusiasm for boats, um, I don't want to just look around the cabins. If I'm looking at a boat personally, I want to go look around the engines. I want to see what the engine room's like. I want to see what the yeah. crew cabin's like. I want to go up on the foredeck. I want to go everywhere. So I carry on doing that with my GoPro. And so I think I'm tapping into all those enthusiasts like me who go, yeah, that's wonderful. They're wonderful, wonderful videos, but I want to know what the engines look like. Right. right. I'm the guy that does that. Well, and, and you bring up a good point is a lot of these videos, um, no matter what, they're they're beautiful videos shot with drones and, and the cinematic qualities are just incredible. But at the same time, seeing the entire boat is something that a lot of people want to see. They want to see the engine room. They want to see the cruise quarters. They want to see basically everything that they could possibly know about that boat. And uh, and having yourself just being such an, an expert in in the field, um, this you're basically their gateway to being aboard these incredible yachts. Well, one of the comments I get quite a lot, and it's a very pleasing comment from my point of view, is people will often say, you know, this is this is like being a mate saying to me, come on up around a boat and taking me around it, and that's yep. exactly kind of what I what I'm doing. That is what I'm doing. I'm you know I'm kind of saying to my audience. Come on, look at this. This is brilliant, and, and that, <laughs> that's how I feel. It's, if I had a friend that was with me, that's what I'd be saying to them: "Say, come and look at this. Let me show you around this. It's fantastic." And and that's what I do on YouTube. And what do you hear from? Uh, do you, I'm sure you read your comments too, right? You re read what people say about. What are some of the things that they say when it comes to, um, you know, them thanking you or helping you for for giving you these these inside looks into these different boats? Anything come to mind? I think the thing that is most predominant, which I really, really like, is the way that YouTube works is a lot of it is down to suggested videos. 
and there's a whole mystery to how the algorithms work that nobody understands. I suspect possibly not even many people at YouTube understand. <laughs> and it changes all the time. How it decides who it's going to show what is, is one of life's big mysteries. <laughs> um, however, it does appear that I think what happens is that, 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 that maybe, I mean, there's, there's a big crossover, for example, between, between cars and boats. Most of the guys who are into power boats are also into cars. Um, and so I suspect, that, I, I, I mean, guessing, purely guessing, but I suspect that, that perhaps because a lot of people who are into cars look at my videos, the algorithms probably say, well, hang on, people looking at cars are looking at this guy's videos. Let's show some other people who are looking at car videos, these videos, yeah. and see if they respond. And so it is pulling in people. That's just one example. I'm sure there's lots of others, but it is pulling people in from outside of the boat world. And what I really like is when I see a comment from somebody saying, I had no interest in boats. I don't even live near the coast. Um, and for some reason, when your video was suggested to me and I've looked around a boat on one of your videos and now I'm hooked, now I'm looking at all of them and I love <laughs> it. And I've even had one guy who said, I've just bought a small boat, only a little six meter, um, is, is like a little, uh, Mary Fisher or something, because I've been enjoying your videos so much. I want to get on the water and find out what it's all like. And to my mind, you know, the way that the, the boating world, I think is, can be quite closed. And if you look at the way that boats are marketed and that kind of thing, you know, that they're, they're in magazines like this, and they absolutely should be, because that's clearly what boat enthusiasts are reading. And so that's yeah. the obvious place to be. But nobody who's not interested in boats is likely to pick up that magazine. And what I think my videos do is they put my boats and all of those boats, i.e. the entirety of that boat, in front of somebody who had no idea. They'll go, I didn't realize these boats like this inside. They're fantastic. They're brilliant. Yeah. Um, and I think that that is what the boat industry needs in general, is um, it needs to be a little more outward looking and trying to be a bit more inclusive to people. The other thing is that, um, and it kind of saddens me a little bit when I read comments like, I do a boat show and people say, well, can anybody come to these boat shows or is it just, you know, just oh, yeah. I'm like, no, come, come do. Please. It, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And even if you're not, you know, interested in buying the latest, 100 foot hatteras come anyway because yeah. there's something for everybody there I, and i think the more as an industry that we can pull people in to what is a brilliant brilliant sport and an awful lot of fun for everybody for the whole family um and it's great for the kids you know everybody can get something out of it um it, it's 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 just a brilliant family event it's it's brilliant with friends everything about it's fantastic and the more that we can put that in front of people the better it is i think Nick, I, I think you brought up a huge point there, which is a lot of, uh, you know, the boating community, some think it's a very tight knit community where, you know, boaters are boaters and non boaters are non boaters. But I mean, you're basically saying that, you know, there's a lot of people out there that are car enthusiasts are enthusiasts in, in other areas in, in the power of the YouTube algorithm, pulling these people from all over the internet and saying, hey, we think you might be interested in this this azimuth video over here. And they're like, what is an azimuth? I don't know, but that picture looks cool. Clicking on it and then watch it, watching you talk about it and elaborate on why it's such a brilliant boat. Um, that, that can bring a lot of different people who wouldn't normally be into boating into boating. And that's powerful. Yeah, absolutely. And my favorite videos on my channel, and, and there's a degree of self-interest to this, of course, is that uh, last year there's a, a, a guy called, um, James Bark, he runs a company called boats.co.uk here in the UK. And I've done some videos with him on his stock boats. Um, and he's a huge fan. He's very supportive of, of Alcoholic. And he's got a charter boat out in the Med, uh, which is a Princess 72. And he's a big fan of, of, of what I do with the uh, with YouTube. But he said, look, why don't you come out to Mallorca, bring the family, have a couple of days on the boat, film it, and put it onto Aquaholic. Um, and so we had this boat, it's, a, it's a, got a crew on it and everything else, and we just went out with this boat, and I'd never done it before, I'd never really got to spend any serious time, I have a boat myself, but it's a little 26 foot, you know, 8 meter, uh, Geno, um, so nothing like this, and we just had two days of absolute unbridled joy, is the only <laughs> word for it, it was probably, well no, not probably, it is one of the best experiences I've ever had in my life, um, and, and we just sort of had a ball. But, and we actually, I mean, I did feel a bit responsible because I thought, you know, this is actually a really expensive thing he's giving us. Yeah. Um, we've got to get some good video out of this. And we did. We actually made five videos in total, three of the trip, one of the boat, 
And then one was a, just a nighttime look around the boats. We went right around the outside of the boat at night with it all lit up and the underwater Ooh, lights on. Yeah. And then walked around the boat on the outside with everything lit up and it looked really cool. Wow. And those videos have done very well. But those, I think, are great because the videos, the, my yacht tour videos show you what a boat is. Mm -hmm. And those videos show you what a boat can do for you. And um, and what they can do for you is give you, I think, more fun and more enjoyment than anything else on, on the planet. No car will give you that much fun. A car will take you somewhere, and it'll be fun to drive it. <laughs> but you can't go there in your car and then go, right, well, now we'll stop and relax, and we'll sunbathe off it, and we'll swim off it, and we'll we'll, we'll have lunch on it. And, you know, it... I, genuinely, the, the boating is the, is the best thing in the world. And I think the more that you can put that in front of people and people who have no idea what it's all about and just think, well, they're just boats parked in a dock and people go and sit on them. Just, you just see people diving off them and swimming off them and, and, and yeah. having lunch on them and everything else. I think it's fantastic. And those videos have done very well. Um, I'm very pleased to say, because I was worried about that, obviously. You know, I really want to give this guy value for his... Uh, uh, for him taking this sort of opportunity and um yeah they've been great and we're hoping to do it again this year on another boat but uh, obviously it depends with the current situation as to whether we'll be able to again but mm -hmm. we're hoping to do that on a sailing boat this year well and uh, and so you mentioned uh, you know some of uh, the videos on your channel so i wanted to bring up uh, his channel here on youtube called aquaholic for anybody uh, out there in the youtube worlds or just google it um and, and check out i mean there's just a ton of great videos here and uh, one in particular, uh, obviously, you've broken 100,000 subscribers, which uh, in the boating world is it's pretty big. I mean, you know, you got a lot of people that they'll watch uh, any latest gaming video or something like that and have 4.5 million subscribers. But when it comes to boating, uh, it's it's definitely uh, it, it's something that people are looking for. And uh, and, and that is a, a definitely uh, we're, we're saying thank you because you're bringing yeah. more people into the boating community. And it's something that uh, in a way that is innovative because uh, there aren't too many places that you can find really good information about boating online. Uh, and so thank you very much for that. We really appreciate that. Um, and so check it out. I mean, there's a ton of great videos here. Um, and notably, I think there's a few uh, that you did uh, with some of the Marie Max uh, brands, including Galleon, which is uh, one of, I wouldn't say it's one of, it, it still is one of the newer brands from Marine Max. Could you tell us a little bit about, and I'll bring it up here while you talk about it, but the Galleon 680 that you had the opportunity to go on? Well, this is one I did in um, Dusseldorf, at the Dusseldorf show uh -huh. in January. And it was the first Galleon I'd done. I was very excited to do it because I had been on Galleon boats in the past when I'd been doing boat reviews for the magazine. I'd reviewed a couple. And they're always... A really innovative boat. I mean, some of the ideas that these guys come up with, I think they've realized that if they want to go head to head with more established brands, they're going to have to come up with more, not just the same, but something that's genuinely alternative and, and in a lot of thought. And they've done it. They've, they've really come up with something I think that's very special. Um, so I was keen to get one of these onto Aquaholic. And in fact, very frustratingly, the very, very last video that I did at Dusseldorf, literally before I left to jump on a plane and come home, was a uh, the galleon, I think it was a 400. And I only discovered afterwards yep. that the GoPro had gone wrong and the oh. microphone had gone uh. So, unfortunately, this uh, 680 is the only galleon that I've had on the channel. But I'm very keen to do more because that video has been extremely popular. People love that boat. Mm -hmm. um, and it, and it, is, uh, it is something that they, they're, doing, they're doing it differently. One of the things they're doing, for example, is a lot more customization. Mm -hmm. um, I think some of the very established builders are, are, are saying for various reasons, including A, the fact that they are very established and they know what people want, and, and B, because of the way that their factories are set up, they're saying, okay, this is the layout. You can choose your colors. You can choose your upholstery and your carpets and things. But what Galleons seem to be to me, and I say, I have only really looked over a couple of them at the show, but they seem to have a lot more flexibility. They say, look, if you don't like this like this, don't worry, we'll, we'll do it how you want it. Mm -hmm. um, and there aren't many people at this level. I mean, obviously, when you go up to sort of 90, 100 feet and above, then you, you, you get in that level of customization. But at this level, it's less common. Um, and I think that's interesting. And there's a lot of, as I say, very neat ideas. I mean, this boat here, for example, you can see it's got the sliding roof over the helm, I think. It looks like it has. Um, yep. And, yep. Yeah, that's something you just don't normally see on a Flybridge 70-footer. Um, so, and the, and the lighting that they put in and that kind of thing. There's a lot of a lot of thought and a lot of uh, how can we do this differently? How can we make this better? Has gone into that boat. 
You're right. And, uh, and one of the big things about Galleon is, is their fit and finish and their use of materials. So you'll see a lot of hardwood. You'll see a lot of, um, uh, you know, stainless steel and just a, it's a Polish boat. And uh, clearly, you know, their craftsmanship is one of the top things that they strive for uh, with this brand Galleon. And, and of course, you being over in Europe, you probably have seen more Galleons. Uh, you're starting to see a lot more here in the States. So uh, we appreciate you hopping aboard the 680, which is one of the latest models here in the States as well. Yeah, I mean, they strike me as a company that's on the front foot. Um, their range, I mean, there's a, a brochure uh, on the boat which had the whole range in, and, and it was kind of, it was like a Bible. I mean, it was like about, <laughs> three, it was about three inches thick. And what's amazing is that, that they'll do like a 60-footer and then like a 62 and then like a 64, and you're thinking most people just do like a 60 and then a 65. Um, and so, again, and each of these boats are slightly different, and so, you know, they really do seem to be trying to, to make sure they've got something in the range that is exactly what you want, not nearly what you want. Oh, yeah. And what do you think about, um, as, as you're kind of, uh, as I'm seeing this, you know, a lot of boat builders, especially Galleon, they, they listen to their customers when it comes to um, the next year, the next model year of, hey, uh, you know, we think it could be using this or uh, just, and a lot of it I feel like is in passing conversation of, you know, hey, I just tried to do this and it, it'd be a lot better if it worked this way. And uh, could you, fr from your background, have you seen something like that in, in ways that's kind of changing the way people are building boats? I think that's true. And I think certainly um, one of the things that we're seeing, and not just Galleon, but right across the board, is that um, uh, boat builders used to be focused, uh, and, and it makes perfect sense until you stop and think about it, but they used to be very focused on the way the boat looks and the way the boat handles, the way it goes through the water, the way, the way right. that it, uh, all that kind of stuff. And that, of course, should be the priority. But I think what they are realizing is that um, the vast majority of users, and we were a perfect example of this, when we went on this charter trip for these two days, of that time, we spent about probably an hour actually underway out of, out of 48 hours. And the rest of the time at anchor, having a great time or sleeping right. on the boat, living on the boat. Yep. And I think that what's changing, and, and Galleon certainly seems to be one of the people who are realizing this, is that um, the accommodation is is paramount. That's what people want. People want space. They want room to breathe. They don't want to feel that they're compromised. Having said that, one thing I did notice with that 680 is they have done things like they put an awful lot of carbon fiber high up in the boat, so the boat is quite tall. It keeps the um, uh, it keeps the the lower. Lower. Um, and also the engine room. A lot of these boats have walk-in engine rooms where you've got standing headroom and going and saying, we're not doing that. We're, we're deliberately not going to have standing headroom in, the, in this boat because if you have standing headroom, the whole boat has to be higher above it you know, the saloon to accommodate it. And then the flyage has to be higher above the saloon to need the headroom in the saloon. Um, so there was a couple of interesting things like that where they're saying, okay, we're not going to compromise the accommodation. But maybe we're going to compromise the engine room a little bit because you only go in the engine room to check the oil and, and, and you know, servicing once a year and that kind of thing. So why do you need all that space in there? Let's put it in other places in the boat. And I, again, I think that's that's quite an interesting outlook from a manufacturer. For sure. Yeah, that you could see that across their, the entire line of galleon boats, too, is that they're optimized for entertainment. Yeah. Uh, like the folding sides, they have like the window that goes all the way down into the, the, the side of the boat and you have got the, the bar stool seats right on the other side. So you can be in the galley and be outside of the boat and have a conversation and have, you know, hors d'oeuvres and cocktails with, with your with your mates. It's, it's an, a beautiful line of boats. Okay, so we're going to move along here. And uh, if the technology is with me today... <laughs> I'm gonna bring up uh, the next uh, model that's uh, caught our eye for sure. And this is a boat that uh, we would love to see more of, and I'm sure we will definitely see more of here in the States, uh, the Azimut Grande S10. Could you tell us a little bit about this uh, this particular video and, and boat? This was an interesting one. Um, this was at Cannes last year. It was, I think I'm right in saying the first time that boat had been shown. I was really, really, really keen to get a video on this. And the rest of the world was really, really, really keen to see it as well. So the boat was permanently full of people. And I think I came back to the boat. I made appointments and, and met the guys there. And they said, I'm oh, really, really sorry. We're full of people. Can you just wait for half an hour? Sort of stuff. And in the end, I think I came back to the boat about three times in order to get this video. Because I really wanted to get it on the channel. And I'm pleased that I did. 
What's interesting about it is just how misunderstood this boat actually is by some people. Some people completely get it and some people don't. A lot of people looked at this video on my channel and said, well, you get a load more space on a X, Y, Z, whatever it might be, uh, yeah. you know, in terms of the cabin space and all that sort of stuff. And what, uh, and what I don't realize is that Asma already have a boat that does that. They're, I think it's the Grand Metri boat. So to have one that's yeah. the same size as this, 100 foot. And that yeah. has all the cabins and all the huge fire bridge and all that sort of stuff. So if you want that, they've already got it covered. What this boat does is it's like buying a a, uh, a Porsche 911 in go, yeah. of a Range Rover. Yeah, I mean you could you could look at a 911 and go, well, yeah, but you've got much more boot space in a Range Rover. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. And it's got you know loads more space in the back. <laughs> yes, it has, and that completely misses the point. What this boat is is a a fabulous big entertaining space it's like a hundred foot speedboat it's not something that you go down to with all of your family you know and, and everything else and go okay we're going to disappear for a month on this boat and then we're going to come back this is the boat that you have in the south of france and you come down with your friends and you go right we're going out for the day you know and then we'll maybe we'll spend the night on the boat or maybe we'll go back to the villa or maybe we'll jump back on the private jet and go off somewhere else um it's not designed for um extended long I mean, clearly you could do it with it of course you could but if you wanted that you'd probably buy as uh, grand metri range this yep. is um an entertaining boat this is sunbeds and it's um space and it's entertaining space they've got a fantastic feature as you go in where they've got like a sort of dining area that you can either close off to the outside uh, and have open to the inside it's like doors either side of it or you can have it closed off to the inside and open to the outside so if the weather's nice you can have it as an outside space or if it's too hot or too cold you can convert it to an inside space. And it's a really clever, interesting boat. But I'll say it was fascinating to see how many people didn't understand it. They just well, went, we can get more room on another boat. Well, yeah, you can <laughs> go and buy another boat there. I, I think you bring up a good point. And uh, especially uh, with Azmet, who their, their their model lineup is is so you know different. You, ha you have the flybridges, which is basically, if you're looking for more space, uh, you go with something mm -hmm like a flybridge, um, but uh, yeah, you, you totally nailed it. The S model lineup is more of that sports car feel, that Ferrari uh, sleek, sophisticated. Um, some of them actually do have flybridges because they're just such a large enough boat, but um, yeah. you, you kind of nailed it with this, uh, with the S lineup. And, and I know you did some other uh, S, I think you did the S8 as well. Um, I did the S8 and I also did some of the flybridge ones. There's an Azimut, I think it's the Azimut, the new 72. Yes. And of course that has the speed. Uh, sorry, the seventy-eight, I believe. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, yes, I think you're right. Um, and, and a very beautiful boat. And the other thing with the yeah. with the Azimut, of course, is they're Italian, and and therefore, just like the cars and the clothes and everything else, it is all about style. Oh, yeah. um, and they are an astonishingly stylish boat. Yeah, and uh, the fit and finish and, and just the materials that they use. Uh, we we recently did some videos with Federico Ferrante, who's uh, the pres president of Azimut Benetti of the Americas, and and just him telling the story. And and similar to what you know your videos are, is is the passion comes out um, looking through these boats and knowing about what goes into them. Um, not only the materials, but just the the minds of the creators. And that's something a lot of these boats are are pieces of art, you know, floating artwork. Uh, in, in every sense of the word, uh, especially with the Azimut brand. I was going to say, I think Azimut possibly more than any because, yeah. because it is very much, you know, what they want from that boat is not to go, wow, look how much space there is. They just want people to, to just go, wow. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, have yeah. an experience. And uh, and we would love for you, uh, you, t you mentioned the, the Grande, uh, the Metris. Uh, you know, we do have uh, over here in the States, there are, are many uh, Grande Metries uh, that we would love for you to walk through one of these days and, and check out for yourself. I'm very, very keen to do that. In actual fact, I tried to do it at the Miami Boat Show and they had one there. Um, 32. And, and they organized me to get on it and everything, but there were just there were just too many people. And I can work around people to some extent. By sort of, I, I don't like to get like clients and that kind of thing on the camera because I think you know a lot of people are very private about this stuff. Sure. Um, so uh, to some extent, that can sort of point the camera down and you just see their feet and stuff. But there were so many people on it, and it was such a popular boat, and understandably so because it was lovely. Um, well, I couldn't do it. But, yeah, very, very keen indeed to do those bigger azimuts in the future because they are, I mean, from a video perspective, well, like you can see right now, they're just like a wonderful thing to simply look at. They're, they're, they're complete eye candy. 
Yes. And, and it's not something that, you know, anybody could just hop aboard. They are at boat shows, but, uh, you know, these are expensive uh, items here. So, you know, it's not like a typical just walk through if any boat you possibly want to go. I mean, there are certain boats that you would have to get permission, of course, to get aboard. So um, yeah. it, you can't keep it as pristine condition uh, unless you keep it to that. So um, it's yeah, just looking here, uh, it's. You can't say enough about these azimuth S10s and the azimuth models, and we're looking forward to having an S10 here over stateside for sure. Yeah, they're gorgeous boats. So let's move what on. What else a you got, bit. Kelly? I know. I, I, I love watching the walkthrough videos, and I, I'm sold. I think I need a GoPro. I can't believe you <laughs> film all of this with a GoPro. It just looks so, you know, the angles to get. Obviously, you've done quite a few of these. Mm. And while yeah. I bring up the next one, too, sorry. Uh, it, I would love to hear about your experience at the Miami Boat Show too and the Miami Yacht Show because, um, you know, it happened just before uh, all the craziness. So we we luckily had uh, our chance to experience the Miami Boat and Yacht Show. Uh, what Tell us about your experience with that. I was uh, extremely lucky um, to have done that because it's kind of what's keeping aquaphoric, aquaphoric, I'll try again. Aquaphoric. <laughs> <laughs> it's what's giving me aquaholic afloat at the moment because uh, I came up with plenty of videos from that and uh, and it's having those sort of in the bank that's allowing me to keep uploading uh, because of, clearly I can't go out and film any more at the minute. In fact, the latest video you got on, onto aquaholic is uh, one that I did a couple of days ago, which was me going for my morning walk along the coast. <laughs> 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 so, um, so I'm very pleased. But the Miami show was the first time that I had taken aquaholic uh, to the States. I've gone down to Europe, obviously to Cannes and places like that because of filming. This was the first time I'd done it in America. Um, and the thing that I found most of all was how welcoming everybody over there was. Good. So, uh, and a perfect example of that. So I, normally I try and organize as much as I possibly can before I go. So I've got a good lineup. I know what I'm going to get. And um, I know I'm not going to waste a trip. But there were things like... Um, uh, I, wa I was walking past the Hatteras stand and I wandered on there and I, I, I do this quite a lot. Normally I get a sort of a very polite, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll call you, we'll let you know. I wandered onto the Hatteras stand and said, I'd really love to film some of your boats. And they said, let me introduce you to, and I uh, can't remember the lady's name offhand, um, but the lady who's their, their PR lady. Um, and she went, yeah, fine, no problem. She said, look, why don't I come into the show an hour tomorrow, an hour before it opens, and meet you here, and you can film whatever you want? And I'm like, well, yeah, brilliant. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So is that what I, we're uh, looking at now, Hatteras? Yeah. So this yeah, is yeah. yeah. This is it. I, I feel a bit embarrassed. I can't ever think of the lady's name, and I remember it as soon as I came off of the camera, off of the off of this. But um, yeah, she was super helpful, um, and the whole uh, sort of very welcoming attitude. Because you do find sometimes in the in the yacht industry that some people can be a little bit or some companies can be a little bit standoffish. Um, and they were fantastic. Um, so it was brilliant. This was all filmed, the ones you're looking at now, before the show even opened. I think I filmed three, three boats for them. Um, and they're not the only ones to do it, I hasten to add. I mean, and, and it's not just the Americans. Uh, I, I, I had a couple of people have a similar attitude down in uh, Dusseldorf. But, but it was nice. I found everybody out in the States was really helpful, really nice. And there was no, there's no attitude out there at all. People are just, just want to be, uh, you know, enthusiastic about the boats and, mm -hmm. and keen to show them off. Yeah. Well, and uh, for everybody watching here, this is the Hatteras 65 GT Carolina, I believe, is uh, uh, new for this year. And uh, what, what incredible boat! We did have an opportunity, Lisa, to check this one out while mm -hmm. we were at the show, right? We sure did. So, uh, Nick, Kelly, and I feel your pain. We did the same thing <laughs> at the Miami Boat Show. We basically wandered around and and stopped into all of our uh, partners' booths and said, hey, we'd like to do a video. And we, I, we, we feel your pain. There's there's a little bit of, uh, all, all right. Uh, but we're, we're actually pulling our, our team members in front of the camera and saying, hey, yeah. we want you to be, give us a walk through this boat. So I always um, feel like boat shows are like the best time and worst time to ask people to do videos because <laughs> yes. you have all the boats sitting in front of you, but you have the people that are working the shows in the most they're they're the busiest they've ever been exactly exactly and to be fair you know i mean i mentioned i was a yacht broker i used to sell boats brand new as well and i've done my fair share of boat shows and for the guys on the boats they are there to try and find customers for those boats that's their right. job. 
not to accommodate Wallies like me wandering around with my GoPro and getting in everybody's way. So I totally understand where they're coming from. But you're absolutely right because the boats are all there. They all look perfect. They're mm -hmm. all dressed up. The covers are off. It's the perfect filming environment. If only it wasn't for the, 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 the visitors, sure. you know, which of course is what the show is all about. So, yeah. so there's a big kind of conflict of interest there. But yeah, generally speaking, people are, are pretty helpful, and and I always do my best to, to particularly having worked for the boat shows, I understand exactly where they're coming from, and if it means I've got to sort of stand and wait for ten minutes or, or try and avoid filming their client or anything like that, then of course you know I, I totally get that, and I totally try and. Uh, and go along with that. So, so generally, I think as long as we all work together, we can, we can all get the results that we want. I, but I, I do see a shift. Um, you know, just a few years back, you know, asking to, hey, can I get you on camera filming this, or can we film this boat or something? A lot of times at boat shows, they're like, we're too busy. But yeah. looking at it now, and the power of the internet and the power of YouTube, um, they see that as an opportunity to get their boats in front of the eyes of potentially millions of people. Every mm -hmm. every boat video is an opportunity to get in front of millions of pizza people potentially. So, I mean, in a lot of ways, they're like, please come aboard, please show my boat. You know, we'd love for you to do that because even if two out of a million would be actually interested in this, you know, 65 GT Hatteras, um, you know, it, it makes a difference big time. Absolutely, and I think that, um the attitudes are changing you're absolutely right um and i and i think you know the thing with with aquaholic is if you actually think about what aquaholic really is it is a 24 hour a day full year round boat show it's exactly yeah. what it actually is you go to a boat show and you want to wander on and look at a look at a hatteras look at an azimut whatever else and you go to a show and you, you kind of you queue up perhaps or you try and arrange an appointment or whatever else and you go and walk around that boat and look at it and then step off and then go and try and find the next one. Well, an aquaholic, you can do that again and again and again. And you can go back and forward and compare and everything else. And um, and I was thinking about this the other day that you know I get I get well over three million views a month currently. And it struck me that that in terms of uh, visitors, maybe not numbers of boats, of course, or that's growing all the time. But in terms of visitors, aquaholic is busier than Southampton Boat Show and Can Boat Show and maybe even yeah. Boat Show all put together. That's a very good point. That is a great and, point. And, and that's, I mean, if, you've, if you don't spend a lot of time on YouTube, that's an insane amount of views. That is... More uh, than you're people. ever going to get at a boat show. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, and, and that's something that we're seeing too, is uh, the, the way that, that online can become your boat show. Um, not, and we talked about, you know, that not everybody can just hop aboard that Azimut S10 and just start walking around it and looking through it, uh, even at a boat show. So, But when you do go on Aquaholic or you go on YouTube and the Marine Max channel and, and you can walk through these boats virtually, I mean, it gives you a really good understanding of what you're getting into um, before you actually pick up the phone and say, hey, I'm interested in this boat. Absolutely. And also from the boat uh, company's point of view, you know, and again, I, I speak as somebody who's done it. There always has to be a degree of prioritizing. The best one in the world, especially on a really big boat like a like the uh, the S10, which everybody wants to see, you physically cannot get everybody wants to look at that boat on that boat. So then you have to start sort of almost making judgments and thinking, well, this guy's got a smaller azimut, so we should definitely get him on. But maybe that guy there we've never spoken to before, maybe maybe we'll we'll see if we can put him off a little bit and get this guy on. And so with YouTube, everybody's welcome, everybody, yep. you know, because. Yep nobody is having to wait because somebody else is looking at that video. That's that's a great way of putting it. And uh, and, and seeing it in from the eyes of a real person as opposed to, uh, oh, let's not cut, let's cut this part and let's, you know, you're showing the boat. And uh, and that's what people want to see. They want to see the functionality right here. We're looking at in the 65 Hatteras. Uh, you're showing, you know, the seating and the storage space and down there, I'm guessing the engine room. And it's like, uh, unless you're doing this yourself, you're basically like giving a person Hey, you know, step aboard this boat and do whatever you want. You walk. You want to check out the engine room? You can check out the engine room, and that's something that uh, even people that get tours of boats in person you don't get to do too often either. So, um, and it's coming from somebody like you who knows and understands, and and that makes a big difference versus somebody who just walks through and says, "This is here's the engine room," and just kind of shows people around. You're you're talking about certain things. You're talking about the manufacturers of who makes the engines and why are these special and. Why are these uh, these uh, different? Uh, you know, why is this all uh, worth it? Or why is it? Uh, why are they using this here? 
What, what is the purpose of this? So it's something that, uh, you know, not too many people get to see these days. And, and honestly, it's becoming something that's been very popular. Obviously, you're seeing uh, the popularity of your channel going up because of that. Yeah, absolutely. And it comes back to what I was saying earlier, which is what I'm showing is what I would want to see as a boat mm -hmm. enthusiast uh, and as a boat owner. What do I want to look at? What am I interested in? And it's probably not exactly the same things that somebody who is an, a, an expert filmmaker but doesn't know a great deal about boats, which of course is often the people who are making videos for, you know, if you're a boat company, you're going to go to some uh, company that makes videos and then last week they might have been making fabulous videos about a car and next week they might be making fabulous videos about uh, a, a, an upmarket apartment and this week they're making fabulous videos about your boat mm -hmm. and they will be fabulous videos but they won't actually be from the perspective of somebody who's just really wants to have a look and see what's under that hatch yep right the insight that you have because you've been through so many boats and you've basically grown up in the boating industry comes out in those videos that's the additive that you get from from the video such as all of your videos you're giving people those extra little tidbits that they don't know you know why is that there well this is why and this is the functionality mm -hmm. it's it's great and uh um uh, federico ferrante from azimut he does the same thing it's you can tell you guys have this this passion and it comes out in this educational way with the videos it's fantastic yeah but well, as i say it's it's part of me in, in the industry for a long time um mm -hmm. and, and it has been sort of 30 odd years um but it's also very much from the perspective of an enthusiast and a boat owner so you know i'm there not as somebody trying to sell that boat i'm almost there as somebody who's you know would be interested in buying it if only i had enough money <laughs> so i am looking at it through the eyes of the buyer not the eyes of the teller well but and it does uh, there there is one thing we talked about was you know not always you want that real video but at the same time i i, I always feel like there's a a funnel of content that me as a, a somebody who wants to buy something i i want both right i want oh. that piece of content that shows somebody using it and telling me exactly about why this is like that but at the same time you do want to get enthusiastic and you want to get you want to dream a little bit and i think you know especially from the manufacturer standpoint and and some of the videos that you see you get that first video of you know the the grandeur and just the people the lifestyle and sitting out there and you know on their sea bobs and diving off the swim platform and then you're like i want that boat and then you start <laughs> you type in that boat at youtube and that's where aquaholic pops up where you're actually saying okay so you saw that boat you saw that that lifestyle shot this is what, let's talk about it. You know, let's get into mm -hmm. the specifics here. And, and for somebody making a decision on a boat, I think that that comes in very, very handy. What I love about YouTube generally in terms of not just boats, but cars and all kinds of things is unlike a boat magazine. So you go walk into the local news agent and you think, shall I buy that magazine or shall I buy that magazine? Okay, well, this magazine has got a boat I'm interested in. So I'll buy this magazine instead of that magazine. Nobody watches a video on YouTube instead of another video yeah. about something that they're interested in. They'll watch both. Um, <laughs> and I'm exactly the same. You know, I bought a new car recently and before I bought the car, the first thing I did was looked at every single video that I could find on YouTube about that car. And that goes <laughs> from the, the super glossy manufacturers, you know, sunset in California car sweeping down the road. Because I want to get sold the dream. Of course I want to get sold yeah. the dream. Yeah. I want to buy into the dream. But then I want to see the guy who's the enthusiast girl, this is really great. Let's open the bonnet, let's have a look under here. This has got the new twin turbo engine, oh, it's fantastic. I want that as well, I want all of it. And I think yeah. that, that is the beauty of YouTube is that there is so much room and so much scope for all of these different aspects of it. And tell us a little bit about, I, I think that also is a good segue into the, the, the education and boating that you're giving to people too, because you're telling about them about all these different specifications and why they're like that um, when it comes to boats you're using terminology that people are basically learning about boating from the videos that you put out so tell us about how you kind of educate your your audience well it's not really a conscious thing but it does happen and <laughs> people do tell me they learn a lot from it so i guess that they do but i guess again it keeps coming back to the same thing it's my own enthusiasm so when i'm looking around for example, at a boat show, there might be a boat that's on a stand and we can see underneath the boat. 
Um, and so sometimes I'll say, hey, look under here. Okay, when I talk about a shaft drive, this is what I mean. You see the shaft that comes out from here? Okay, it's got the propeller on the end of it. That shaft is spun by the engine. The propeller goes around, and the rudder behind it, that's what steers the boat. Because it's there and it's interesting, rather than because it's it's educational. The fact that it's educational is is a, a byproduct and, and a very helpful one, apparently. But that's why I do it. And then I might go on another boat as a pod drive. I go, I Volvo Penta IPS. And I say, okay, with this, there's no rudder. There's no shaft. There's a pod and the pod swivels. They both swivel independently of each other. And that's how the boat maneuvers. Um, and again, it comes from uh, the enthusiasm for it rather than the, the desire to educate. But clearly people are picking up from it. And I do think actually it is important to try and demystify this stuff because, you know, when you look at stumbling blocks, a lot of people, I think, they look at the boat industry uh, or, and that kind of thing, or they pick up a boat magazine, or maybe even go out on a friend's boat and they hear all these different terms and people talk about shaft drive and port and starboard and fly bridge, and they think, I have no idea what this guy's on about. And they step off that boat completely just mystified by the whole thing i think that's a great day out but i couldn't begin to to understand how to operate one and i think if you can gradually introduce these terms to people where when somebody mentions a flybridge they go oh yeah that's the bit up on top i know that and when they uh when people talk about shaft drive they go yeah i understand what shaft drive is and i think the the more people understand the topic uh, and uh and the sort of behind the scenes if you like Mm -hmm. The more comfortable they feel about it and the more empowered they feel when they maybe go and look at a boat, you know, they'll come to you guys to look at a boat and you might say to them, well, this one's got an outboard engine. They think, oh, yeah, I know what an outboard engine is. Yeah. Um, and, and it just makes the uh, makes experience a little bit more inclusive for them mm -hmm. and, um, and it makes it feel a little bit less alien. And I think that can only be a good thing. Well, and the, the beauty, too, is when they're watching your videos, they're sitting in front of either a computer or their phone. So while you talk about outboard engines, they can start Googling outboard engines and start learning about how that works. So, um, For sure. Yeah, and they can pause and they can rewind and they can do whatever they want. And it, these are all stuff when you go and look at a boat, um, you know, you only get that finite, you walk to the engine room and someone goes, it's shaft drive, and you go, oh, okay. And then you walk out of the engine room thinking, I've no idea. Yeah, they just You know, so... Um, uh, <laughs> so yeah, I, I think that that's um, that's a powerful tool for people. For sure, yeah, yeah. and it's uh, it's great for the industry too. In in a whole of uh, bringing people in, not only uh, as potential uh, owners of boats, but people that want to get into the industry themselves and to work into it because it's such an exciting industry to be in, and it's only getting more exciting. I mean, you look at the outboard engines here on this Boston Whaler 420 Outrage, and and just see how far those have come in the past decade. Uh, right. And just center consoles, and in, in these these boats are just uh, you know ten years ago seeing a forty two outrage it would just be blowing your mind, and and now uh, look at this thing. So tell us about that a little bit, and how uh, some of these innovations are changing the industry. Well, I think it comes back to what we were talking about earlier, which is that boat designers are starting to focus much more on how boats are used and what makes for a good day out on the boat. So mm -hmm. if you go back. Well, certainly when I was growing up, you know, I mean, I was in love with the sort of um, the Miami Vice style um, scarabs and donsies and that kind of thing. Um, but actually, if you look at them from a going boating point of view, they're fantastic when you're blasting down the coast. You've got a great hull and everything else. But you've got that huge long foredeck, which makes it <laughs> fantastic. You've got a little tiny cockpit and a huge great sun pads over the engines, which yeah. looks fantastic. And then you, you drop anchor and you realize that all the seats are facing the same direction. <laughs> There's yeah. There's nowhere to put a table. There's nowhere to get a uh, a drink out of a fridge without going downstairs, uh, and so on. Now you look at this Boston Whaler here, and this Boston Whaler, which is still a very serious high performance uh, sea boat. Mm -hmm. Look at the the way the seats swivel, and the, the you've got a deck galley there, and you've got seats at the back that fold away for fishing. I mean, try and fish off a scarab. I mean, it would just be <laughs> you know, and that's what people want to do. So what you've got here is basically the perfect day out you know you take a family out on that boat and whether you want to dive whether you want to fish whether you just want to charge down the coast with your mates at 40 knots um <laughs> you just want to run down the coast to a restaurant and then run back up as the sun setting whether you want to spend a night on board whether you want to have a picnic on the boat there are different areas of that boat you can use and the and the, the most important point of all i think is the fact that from those outboards, which of course put the engines right at the very, very back of the boat and therefore make the rest of the boat just boat rather than engine space, from the back of that boat forward, 
every inch of that boat pretty much is usable. There's always somewhere where you can walk or sit or put a table. You know, you can walk right to the bow. More importantly, your kids can walk right to the bow mm -hmm. yep. without thinking, oh, my God, they're going to fall off. They're going to fall off. Um, you know, there's a sunbed there when you get there. There's a table there to sit around. Those seats at the front, um, the back parts of them lift up so that people can right. sit. You know, when you're cruising down the coast, the first thing you notice is people want to sit and look forward when you get when you're doing sort of you know, six knots looking at the dolphins and stuff. <laughs> what a brilliant idea to put a backrest that pop up so that mm -hmm. people can sit there and relax against them. You know, yeah. and it, that's what this boat does. The the functionality of these things is unbelievable, and it's it's beyond all comprehension of of what you would expect from a 42 foot high performance boat 20 years ago. Right. Yeah, and we just had the opportunity to speak with Boston Whaler, uh, Will Rogers, uh, who's uh, in charge of the large boat division at Boston Whaler, and, and we talked about that and you know how it's just changed in, in the past ten years of, of functionality, comfort for sure, um, it, just storage space. I mean, you, you basically lift up any seat on these boats, and you're going to find storage space. You're going to find place to put anything. You're going to pop. I mean, look at boom, there you yeah. go. Uh, and uh, and just it's incredible. And, and like you talked about the safety too for children of, of walking around and you know hoping uh, you know there, there's not going to be any issues there with safety. I mean. Uh, it's just it's it's really cool what you're seeing these days and the, the walk around space you're kind of showing it there it's uh and then you can put a tower up top i mean <laughs> yeah yeah for sure um and there's a cabin as well of course you know so it's getting a bit hot on a hot day you come down here it's air conditioned or if you want to spend the night on the boat you can do which of course kids love that it's like camping you know they love mm -hmm. all that stuff so to spend a night on the boat is brilliant there's a toilet down there I mean, never underestimate the value of toilets on a boat. And a lot of yeah. boats, you know, you have 30 foot boats that don't have toilets on them, or they do, but they're just like a chemical toilet. Um, yeah. And, you know, without wanting to be at all sexist about it, but, you yeah, know, a, a lot of ladies are going, and I used to find a smaller boat once um, that didn't have a separate loo, it had a loo under a, under a seat like this. Um, and you'd find that you'd say to them, look, there's a toilet on the boat, use it whenever you like. And they, and they wouldn't. And then you'd realize that they weren't drinking anything because they didn't want to. You know, and <laughs> the next boat I got, one of the things that absolutely had to have was a toilet, a separate toilet where you open mm. the door, you go, and it's like being at home. And that's what this Boston Mailer has got. You'll see it in a minute. And it sounds like a daft thing, but the difference in comfort and just the way that people feel on that boat, where they just they don't even have to say anything to anybody. You want to use the loo, you just wander downstairs and you open the door and you go and use the loo just like you would at home. And it it transforms the day out. And I think that that's what these guys are really understanding. Here we go. This is what these guys are really understanding now is that if you can provide this kind of stuff, then you are going to transform the experience for the family. And if you, and you know, guys aren't stupid. They know that if, and, and, and it sounds a bit sexist, but it just tends to be the way it is. For it's, boats. True. Be, it's just true. It's true. It is true. There are plenty of women that buy boats and uh, of, of course there are, but the point is that if, whether you're a woman or a man, if you can, keep your family happy if you can keep your family thinking when you say hey we're going on the boat this weekend have them thinking brilliant that's mm -hmm. great that is yeah. what you want that's that's the most important thing that your boat can do for you because it doesn't matter how fast or how flash your boat is if you say hey we're going boat this weekend and they'll go oh, do we have to then <laughs> yeah, yeah you're doing it wrong <laughs> you know, and, and this boat this this boston whaler as a day boat is and, and all these new semi console style boats are just such a massive massive win from that perspective um yeah. and i think that they really are allowing families to do the kind of boating that years ago as far as day boats go they wouldn't be able to do so in one other thing uh, i notice uh, in especially with whaler is the, is the functionality too so you as you're going in here um i know the storage space they always i think that thing uh against the back there is is actually kind of folds down for additional storage space when it's not in use um, I could be wrong. I know that they do that on, I think, the 405 Conquest, the new one. But also, I mean, if you look and, you know, you have a full shower in there, too. So all the, a, a, a space where you can just do all these different things in one space that would typically just be a toilet or something like that. I mean, it's it, look at all that space. I mean, and it's a rainfall shower as well. So, um, yeah. <laughs> and again, you know, you go swimming and it's great. Swimming off a boat is the best thing in the world. But then if you spend the rest of the day feeling a bit sticky because your hair's yeah, full of salt. Salty. You know, the ability to, um, and again, it comes down to that family thing, the ability to have an afternoon on the boat and everyone has a wonderful time and he's swimming off the boat and then they say, okay, let's go and have a shower. 
get changed, you, you pull your fresh clothes out of the wardrobe because the, that's on the road as well, and people feel yeah. all fresh and clean, and then you go for a meal, and then you jump in the car and drive home, and everybody feels fantastic, rather than all caked in salt and tired, and they don't want to go to a restaurant because they're all full of hairs all messed up and everything else. And I think if you can provide that experience for people, you know, it's it's almost as though the most important things for boats these days is to appeal to people who are not that into boats, because if you can get them enjoying the boating experience, then the guys who are into boats or the girls who are into boats can go boating because their family want to go with them. Right. And now the fact that they're bringing that to, to center consoles in these smaller boats, uh, it, it really is a game changer. And speaking of which, it just made me also, also think about is, is, is sea keeper uh, stabilization and how in the past you had, you know, you basically are like, well, I'm not going boating because I get seasick. And yeah. uh, I mean, the fact that you have something like Seakeeper now where you can basically flip it on and that 42 outrage is a perfect example of one of those. Um, you can flip it on and, and not have to worry about uh, rolling around and, uh, you know, feeling a little queasy throughout the day. I mean, you just go boating. Yeah, exactly. And even silly things like, you know, you put your drink on the table and the boat, boat goes past and then the, the wake hits you and you're not looking and then your drink's on the floor. And, and it's just, you know, it's just these annoyances. Um, but it's true, I think, as well across things like, for example, you know, I mean, as I say, I started my, well, boating started back in, for me, in, in the late 70s and, and the boat industry started in uh, 89. And back then, um, you know, I was dealing mostly with power boats. You would never see a bow thruster on anything really under 45 feet. A brand new flybush boat with a bow thruster uh, mm -hmm. at 45 feet, it was quite unusual. It was an option extra, you had to tick it. Now you're seeing 25 foot boats with bow thrusters and that's just making life easier, you know, because again, yep. if you're the guy, you're out with your family, the last thing you need at the end of the day is to be sort of, you know, getting it wrong as you come into the dock and you <laughs> punch the thing and you shout yep. at your wife or she shouts at you. People are watching. And, and you all, yeah, exactly. And you all walk away thinking, oh, God, you know. Um, if you can come in and you've got complete control over the boat and everything has made that little bit easier for you and uh, and it just makes life enjoyable and fun rather than a massive challenge and a, and a, and a complete pain, then yeah. you are transforming the boating experience, not just for the, whoever is with the boat, but for all those people who are with it. And, you, and yeah. you feel like a pro doing it too. I mean, you know, especially with the joystick technologies backing yeah. in and, and just seamlessly doing it uh, and everybody watching, you know, you're, yeah. you're, you feel like a pro, you feel like a captain that's 20 years, 30 years in the, in the into boating. Exactly. In fact, the, the irony is that, I mean, I, having been boating a long time and when you're selling boats, you have to be good at handling them because you need the guy that you're demonstrating the boat to think, well, this is, yeah, this looks pretty easy. I can do that. Yeah. So, so I became quite good at, at driving these these older boats with those thrusters and everything else, and and that becomes a sort of a point of pride. And now you watch somebody get on a boat that's been boating for a month and and can just make the whole boat go completely sideways into the bird, <laughs> and you think it's just too easy now. That's, they're not going to me anymore, are they? Because I mean, when I make that happen, that was that used to be good, yeah. <laughs> and now it's just normal. Yeah, when well, you still have the purists out there that are like, I'm not touching any of that joystick stuff. <laughs> I'm not touching that. I'm sticking yeah. to the sticks. And... Yeah. So personal preference, Nick. Are you? What, would you prefer joystick over manual thrusters? What do you? What's your? What would you be your preference? I, I'm old school, and um, <laughs> yeah, joysticks. If you start boating with a joystick, then it's probably incredibly intuitive. Um, but I tend to sort of come in on the joystick thinking, oh, yeah, this is, this is great. This joystick business is fantastic. And then when I actually get to the berth, I'm like, okay, I'm back on the throttles. Yeah, <laughs> right. The because um, it's just what I've grown up with. And uh, so, so yeah, I, I, I tend I tend not to. I, but I do have a, my, my current boat, as I mentioned, is, is eight meters. It's 26 foot. And um, and I bought it secondhand. And one of the things that I, that I knew that I didn't need was a bow thruster. I just don't need a bow thruster 26 foot, but I know it is a bow thruster it's ridiculous. And this boat came with a bow thruster. The previous owner had fitted a bow thruster. And, and honestly, the amount of times I'm like, oh, it's looking a bit wrong. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, it'll, be, it'll be very interesting to see the, the next generation of boaters, whether or not, you know, are they just going with all the automated systems or are they still going to learn the, uh, the traditional methods? The thing is, though, the way I look at it is I do a lot of, I, I learned to uh, use a camera and do a lot of the boat photography. But I look at the uh, the old school guys from sort of 20 years before, 
and they didn't have autofocus and they didn't have digital cameras they didn't know what they got until they got home they could only put 36 photos on i'm there with my slr so we go okay i just need two of those to be good uh, and then i can look on the camera and think well they're not very good can we go past again and i think you know i'm cheating like mad doing this really uh, but i couldn't do it the old school way it would just terrify me yeah. so uh you know i have a lot of respect for those guys that used to do photography in the old-fashioned way i couldn't do it but that technology has allowed me i'm, I'm not saying that anyone just pick up a camera and point at the boat or get perfect shots you just have to understand the basics of it but um it just makes life so much easier and i, right. I don't think we could do it without the autofocus and without being able to check the pictures and without being able to try different things and take 500 shots if i want to and so it's the same with people coming into boating now i just think you know actually if that's making your life easier and it's allowing you to do what you need to do uh, and feel confident and comfortable in doing it then great good for you right so well, what is a perfect day out on the boat look like for nick burnham <laughs> Uh, the perfect day is friends and uh, loved ones and family and uh, a beautiful day and calm weather and actually not necessarily going that far i'm not into intrepid trips i'm not into rough water we just want to cruise down the coast we want to anchor in a bay we want to have some lunch have a few drinks swim off the boat have a wonderful afternoon peace and quiet and then cruise back up the coast as the sun setting tie the boat up go and find a nice restaurant have a lovely meal and then head home having had a brilliant day. And I think, again, I'm going back to what I was saying earlier, you know, it's not, boating really is not necessarily about big intrepid trips and that time we crossed the channel and it was a four six and the waves were coming over the top <laughs> we made it, oh, it's fantastic. It's not, it's just about going in and having a relaxing time and being with your friends and your family and just chilling out and relaxing. There's enough pressure in the world everywhere else. You don't need it in your boating life, I don't think. I'm a fair weather boater. That, uh, that sounds like an excellent day to me. <laughs> what would you say to uh, to uh, somebody who might not be completely into boating just yet, but they want to get into it? What What are some pieces of advice you would give them? I would say uh, maybe try. It depends what level you're at, of course. If you've got the money, try chartering because that's a completely stress free way of getting on the water, where somebody else is taking care of everything, and you can just see whether you like being out on the water. Um, so that's great, or indeed, you know, a little lower down the scale, a boat hire. Um, the other thing I would say is that uh, don't get het up with having to have a huge, great boat, and, and the fact you could have millions of pounds and all that kind of stuff. You know, all these boats they all float on the same stuff. <laughs> and, uh, you know, my first boat was an, was a little. Uh, how long was it? It was a three. No, it wasn't even three meters. It was a two point eight meter rib with an eight horsepower outboard and we used to put it on the roof of the car and take it down oh. to the river drop it in the water take the outboard out of the boot bolt it on the back of the boat motor up the river in this thing stick it on a beach have a picnic uh motor back down and that was but we were boating we were boating just oh. as much as anybody else we might not have had hot and cold water and you know all, all the facilities but i but you've got to start somewhere and i would say for people it doesn't matter you don't have to have the biggest boat in the marina just get yourself a boat get yourself a float, get yourself something reliable, get some good advice and go and do it. And once you start doing it, you know, the other thing is your first boat will always be wrong. It'll always be <laughs> it was great. But if we had, just like me, you know, that first boat I bought, I thought it's got to have a proper sea toilet. That's the most important thing. So you've got a loo on the boat. You can stay out. You don't have to come back. But I didn't understand that actually what you need is a proper sea toilet, ideally in a compartment. So that, you know, like you have a home and that makes such a difference. So it's not until you've owned a boat that you realize what you really want. So again, I would say just buy something small and cheap, get yourself on the water and have some fun. And then you'll realize that what I enjoy from this boating experience is fishing or is diving or is mm -hmm. just having picnics with the family or is just lying in the sun. And then you'll know whether you want a boat with sunbeds or with more room for fishing or with the ability to go further afield. But just go and do it. Just go and do it and have some fun with it. The other great thing about boats is, you know, you buy a new car for 100 grand and after five years, it's worth 10 grand. You buy a secondhand boat for 100 grand and after five years, it's probably worth 95 grand. You know, mm -hmm. it's they do hold their value. If you if you buy wisely, and you take some good advice and you buy from the right people, um, you know, it, you're not going to completely lose your shirt on it. Um, so just go and do it. Go and do it and have some fun. I think that's excellent advice. Excellent advice. 
Well, we appreciate it today. I mean, there's so many different things we could talk about. Uh, I, I think that we have to do round two sometime in the near future. So, uh, but um, it, so where can they find you? If, if people want to learn more about Aquaholic, uh, where, the, where can they find you? Uh, basically, if you go to YouTube and tap in Aquaholic, um, that's where I am. He dominates. Yeah. <laughs> All of the search results. Absolutely. I, I haven't tried it, but I would guess that if you actually just go to Google and tap in Aquaholic, it'll probably bring some of the videos up. Yeah. I'm sure. um, but I would say to people, you know, have a good look through because there's all sorts of different stuff. So, for example, there's trips on my boat. So you mentioned the perfect day out. Okay, so then one of the videos we've got is called, I think it's something like the perfect 24 hours of boating, and it was where me and my partner uh, and her son, uh, who was 12 at the time, and we went out, we took the boat out and went over to Brixham, which is about 10 miles. No. Four or five miles across the bay, beautiful evening, had fish and chips on the boat. And the next day we went down the coast, which is a brilliant day out. And I made a little video of it. And, um, you know, so it's not just yacht tours, there's stuff like that on there. And again, if you want to see what boating is about rather than just what boats are about, it is on there. But there's about 250 videos on there now and it's climbing all the time. So just have a good scroll through would be my advice. There you go. I mean, it's quarantine time for most people right now. So we've got time to watch uh, all the boat videos. Yeah. One of my favorites, it's not boat related. Well, I guess it could be, was uh, when you were in Miami, you did the stops around Miami Vice. Yeah. Like all the, all the, I, of, of course, Vice. I watched that one of all the videos. It's like, oh, look at this. I, I absolutely love, love that. I love Miami Vice. I've always, I think Miami Vice is probably one of the things that got me into boating, seeing the seeing the Wellcraft Scarab blasting around and that kind of thing was definitely oh, yeah. a big influence. When Miami Vice was out, I must have been about uh, 15, 16, something like that, and everybody wanted to be Don Johnson. Oh, yeah. Um, and I have all of the, uh, every episode, I have all the box sets of every, every oh, series. Oh, my gosh. And I, I genuinely watch them. In fact, I've got a friend of mine called Sean who is uh, who's also a Miami Vice fan, and we have Vice Nights, and he comes over, and we have a chat with yeah. And then we stick an episode on and we watch it. Um, so to actually go to the Miami, I've been to America several times and always been close, but never got to Miami. So when I knew I was going to the boat show, I deliberately took an extra day and said, okay, uh, I've got to just spend the day. And I, I researched the different uh, places. And I went and I had a, uh, a day looking around the, the various places where they'd film Miami Vice. Now, the thing you're seeing here on the video, which is quite funny, is I was walking along my own, my own business along South Beach and there was a white Ferrari with a roof down part of the side of the road. I stopped to look at it like you do. And this guy came over in a Ferrari shirt and said, do you want to have a drive of it? And I'm thinking, What's, what, what are you on about? You know, and he, it turned out they had this thing and they were hiring it out. Yeah. Um, and you could hire it for $100 for half an hour, I think it was. And, I, and if it had been any other car, if it had been a white Porsche or a black Lamborghini, I'd be a white Ford. Ferrari. It was a white Ferrari, which is, of course, in Miami Vice, it was, in, in most of it, at least, it was a white Ferrari. And I thought, I cannot. Yeah. Not live a white it's like meant to be. Like Tess Rosa. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. I mean, what better way to to just cruise through uh, the streets of Miami than uh, in a white Ferrari for sure, and then Absolutely. head up over to the Miami Yacht Show. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, uh, and there's a wonderful bit as well. In fact, you just paused on it here, and it was just one of those weird things. You couldn't have set it up if you tried, but uh, we took it across this um, causeway. Yep. So we give it a bit of welly. As we came up the ramp to come back onto the causeway, there's a motorbike there. Uh huh. And I came up alongside this bike, and and um, the person I was with was was I'd asked him to do some filming of me, and you can see the bike in the background, and you can just see I look at the bike, and he looks at me in the Ferrari, and, and he goes like this, and I went oh, dusted <laughs> <laughs> him. Was hysterical, yeah. <laughs> That's so cool. Well, we can't wait for you to get back uh, stateside again and uh, and check out some of these latest boats and. Uh, we do have a, a lot of boats for you to check out. Of course, you know, Ocean Alexander, we would love for you to get aboard an Ocean Alexander with their new Re Revolution series and, and just so many more from them, for sure. I think that'd be right up your alley. I'm very, yeah. very keen to see those, actually. I have seen them on online and so on, but I've not got on board of one yet. Um, and, you know, and before this whole lockdown situation, you know, I was very, very keen to come over to you guys and just spend a couple of days with you and just say, OK, you know, throw a dozen boats at me and let's do some videos of them and i'd still like to do that as soon as we get the opportunity you know boat show or no boat show it doesn't matter i'll just come over there and, and we'll just spend a couple of days out there and, and for sure about 25 percent of my viewers um just to touch very briefly on the mammy vice thing i discovered back in 2012 not after becoming a journalist that the mammy vice boat the scarab had been restored 
And uh, so uh, I contacted the guy who had it up for sale and um, spoke to the editor of the magazine and said, can we do a feature on this? Because it's fantastic. And he said, yeah, absolutely. Um, get some photographs from the guy and get them sent over and do write something up. And we'll put it in the magazine. So I contacted the owner and he said, come over and have a go on it. And I, I said, yeah, I've got to go and have a go on this. You're going to have to pay for me to go. And he said, no, no, we're not, we're not going to pay for flights. And I said, <laughs> fine, forget it. I'll pay for the flight. So I'm just going to go. Um, and I did, I actually made a, a kind of like a loss on the story as it were. They, they paid me less than the trip cost me. But it was a but dream. I the money I spoke. Now I made a video of that um, very early on. It wasn't a very good video, but I put that on Aquaholic and that was one of the first things that really boosted the channel. But because of that, I think because of that, when I look at the statistics, about a quarter of my audience for Aquaholic is from the USA. I'm partly because it's a big place anyway, and partly because it's very boaty, but I think also partly because of the Mummy Buy stuff. So, again, very keen. That's why I came to the Mummy Boat Show, was to get some American boats like Hatteras and that kind of thing. Um, and we'd love to do that with you, to come over there and get some more American boats for my American viewers. Absolutely. Well, I, think, I think we know some people, so we can, uh, we can certainly <laughs> make that happen. If you can't get me on a boat, nobody can. <laughs> For sure, for sure. So well, awesome, Nick. Thank you so much for joining us. We definitely look forward to meeting you in person and having you do your uh, um, American yacht tour. Um, follow him uh, at Aquaholic on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, he's got a lot of great content. Again, thank you so much for being our guest today. Anything else you'd like to say to the folks? No, I think about Cosa. I need to say it's been a real pleasure. Love talking boats, as you've probably gathered. Yes, and, we can uh, feel your passion. <laughs> no, it's been really great to be on, and thank you very much for having me. All right. Well, thank, thank you. And you so uh, I do have to say, real quick, before we leave, uh, if there's any boats in particular that Marie Max carries that you'd like uh, Nick to, to check out in the future, uh, okay. we'd love to hear that in the comments, too. Uh, anything that you're particularly interested in, we'll, we'll try to make that happen, too. So, and of yeah, course, sure. I'm always very keen to hear what people want to see because then we can show it to them. Yep, yep, for sure. Well, thanks, Absolutely. Nick. We appreciate it. And we'll let you get on with, uh, I'm guessing, your evening at this point, right? Getting close. Yeah, good, <laughs> yes. All right. As always, stay healthy and boat happy. We'll see you next time. Cheers. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.